Okay, I think we're mostly back. We're still on time. Uh, good, so I'm delighted to um, move things forward and talk to you about new and emerging systemic treatment options for metastatic kidney cancer. Uh, trying to hit a few highlights um, for really uh, uh, more of an overview of, of the medical oncology field. Um, so going back to a figure I showed you at the outset, uh, kind of an overview uh, of what's available, uh, what we have for kidney cancer uh, in a comprehensive way over time. Uh, and as I pointed out previously, uh, changes in the overall concept of approach to treating kidney cancer from a time where there really was no effective therapy and um, just supportive care for patients uh, to a long interval of immunotherapy, which was fairly novel for, for metastatic cancer, uh, with cytokine therapy, uh, those guys still hang around, uh, both interferon and interleukin-2 still have a role for some patients, uh, but the dominant drug in the last 10 years has been uh, agents from what are called targeted therapies. Uh, and until just recently, as I made reference to, uh, a brand new entrant, a new drug class, immune checkpoint blocking antibodies. And so we'll touch on uh, some of the changes, three new drug approvals in the last uh, eight months for kidney cancer. So just to remind you that the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma uh, is a broad uh, uh, category that includes multiple different subtypes. Uh, and the identification is based on your pathologist looking at the tissue under the microscope and uh, reading out the histologic pattern of the tumor growth and, and declaring uh, what subtype uh, the tumor is. Most of the clinical research uh, and data we'll look at is, for better or worse, limited to clear cell patients. So it homogenizes the range of tumors to some degree, uh, but many of you here probably uh, don't have clear cell. And uh, so unfortunately, that the talk today really won't touch on some of the nuances uh, for the less common subtypes of kidney cancer. Uh, so I put together a table that shows you sort of by drug category, uh, 12 FDA-approved therapies that we have available to us. Um, so breaking down the whole family of drugs into either immunotherapy compounds or targeted agents. So the immunotherapy, the old time cytokines, interleukin-2 and interferon alpha, uh, and then the brand new entrant that, that is a new drug class, what are called checkpoint blocking antibodies, nivolumab or Abdevo, that was FDA approved November 2015. Uh, our targeted therapies, uh, many of the agents uh, attack or block a signal um, from a hormone, a growth signal called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, um, that's uh, uh, made by the tumors and acts on the vasculature around the tumor to drive blood flow, uh, oxygen, nutrient supply to the evolving tumor. So blocking that biology either with an antibody, uh, bevacizumab or Vastin, that binds the VEGF uh, hormone itself, or what are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uniformly oral medications that um, block the signal uh, at the, the end organ, the vasculature, that the VEGF binding to its receptor creates. Uh, and so two brand new entrants within this field of drugs, uh, two new TKIs approved in this calendar year in 2016, and we'll comment on that a little bit. Uh, and then another target within the tumor proper uh, signaling hub uh, called the mTOR protein and drugs that block that signal cascade. Uh, Temsirolimus, Everolimus. So where do we start? Uh, newly diagnosed kidney cancer, you come into the clinic, we're going to talk to you about uh, medical therapy. Uh, so a couple of, of pertinent features. Uh, right now, 2016, we do not have predictive markers we can use that really guide us in a meaningful way to choice of treatment. Uh, we'd love to have some molecular profiling that we could look at and we'd give you a personalized roadmap and say these are the best drugs for your cancer, these don't work at all, and here's where we're going, and the next patient may be 180 degrees opposite. Uh, lovely idea, personalized medicine uh, has a lot of, of play in the field, but we're really not at that point uh, at, this, at this point in time. Uh, and the other point is pragmatic, not all of our drugs have an FDA approval to be used as initial therapy for kidney cancer, so you can't simply prescribe across the board any of the drugs that you choose. If you apply them out of context, your, your prescription will be declined as an off-label prescription by most insurance providers. So it boils down to uh, a simplified number of choices. Um, and once again, thinking for the most common presentation, metastatic clear cell, uh, what are we thinking about as standard agents? We're thinking about the option of high-dose interleukin-2, 
which still has, has a role uh, in our clinic. Uh, for most patients, we're thinking about targeted therapies. And the three agents or um, combinations that right now are considered the best available therapy as initial treatment uh, are the oral medicines, sunitinib or sutent, pizopinib or votriant, uh, and then the combination of bevacizumab with interferon is considered uh, an equivalent choice. Uh, I can tell you I almost never use that combination in patients coming to me from other uh, oncologists in the community. Nobody uses uh, bevacizumab interferon very much. Um, really for practical reasons, uh, bevacizumab is an IV infusion every two weeks, so you have a fixed clinic schedule. Interferon is pretty obnoxious if anybody's had that drug. Uh, it's not a friendly drug. Um, so you don't come out ahead with that combination. Uh, it's more cumbersome. The oral medicine, Sutent and Votrint, we feel are very patient friendly. You're taking medicine at home. Uh, patients that want to travel, be out of town. It's very flexible. It's, it's a fairly convenient uh, way to go. So a choice between those agents is almost always uh, the first choice for targeted therapy. Uh, and not to forget our clinical trials program. All of our treatments are fundamentally imperfect. Uh, so we're always looking for what's coming, what's new, what may be better than what we have. And we think participating in a research trial, if it makes sense for where you stand disease-wise, is, is a good choice. So uh, many of you here have been in our clinic and, and we've had a conversation about three different options for kidney cancer. And that's, that's the different categories we're thinking about. Uh, so just a couple comments on IL-2. Uh, it is a unique therapy. Uh, we're the only um, center in, in Seattle-Tacoma that routinely does IL-2 therapy. So we do get some patients coming to us specifically uh, interested in IL-2. Uh, it's a toxic therapy. It's cumbersome to, to deliver. You have to be in the hospital. And in fact, you're admitted to the ICU uh, care suite in the hospital. Uh, and some of the, the nuances for IL-2, we only offer it to patients with clear cell histology seems to work uh, less well for the other family of kidney tumors. You have to be physiologically young, so you can't have bad medical problems, no organ dysfunctions, good kidney, good heart function. Uh, there's, there's a commonsensical uh, uh, scale called a performance status in the oncology field. Uh, basically, how sick are you from your cancer? Is it totally unknown to you, you function at a normal level, and it's just a scan that has spots on it, or is the cancer making you ill in some fashion? And so. Uh, performance status needs to be a person that's functioning at a normal level despite their cancer. Uh, we like the idea of treating patients that have very limited disease in their body. Uh, and so we're expecting patients that are candidates for IL-2 have seen Dr. Gore or one of his colleagues. They've had so-called cytoreductive nephrectomy. We've taken out the primary tumor and ideally the dominant tumor mass in their body. And they're left with small volume tumor findings that are not causing symptoms. They're not poised to cause symptoms or some catastrophe if they grow larger. It does chew up some time to get organized for IL-2. You can't have a cancer that if it grows slightly larger, something awful is going to happen. Uh, and there's data that says prior kidney cancer therapies may pose a risk for IL-2 treatment. It may increase the side effect profile. And so we prefer to offer IL-2 as your initial therapy uh, and not leave it for a rainy day after you've had multiple prior treatments. Uh, if we're going to do IL-2, we're going to ask you for a couple of screening tests, a brain imaging study, a cardiac stress test would be things that we wouldn't typically do uh, in the clinic for other therapies. Depending on the medical history, maybe a formal lung study as well, of pulmonary function studies. Uh, why do we still think about IL-2? Uh, it's cumbersome. We put you in the hospital. We've got simple oral medications you can take at home and go about your business. Uh, and so these graphs really uh, give you a picture of what we're hoping to accomplish with IL-2 therapy. So starting on the, the left side here, the response profile, uh, this is uh, data from the NCI campus, the first uh, medical campus that used IL-2 in the country. 20-year uh, experience in their hands, so uh, 86 to 2006, nearly 260 patients uh, that they're reporting on. So what happens to patients? A small group of patients had a complete response of their kidney cancer. All findings on their scans went away. 8% of patients in their hands. Another group of patients, uh, the cancer shrunk, but it didn't fully disappear. So partial effects in 12%. So 20% of patients having a marked effects in terms of their follow-on scans. Unfortunately, that means 80% of patients went to the trouble of receiving IL-2 uh, and really didn't benefit in, in a strong way. Uh, but it's the complete responders that we're fascinated with uh, in the kidney cancer field. Uh, if you have a complete response and you follow these patients over time, uh, and given the very long time IL-2 has been available to us, 20 years of follow-up. The solid majority, 70% of patients with a complete response, maintain that response. The cancer never comes back. And if you look at the overall survival stratified by, by the response, if you're a complete response, partial, 
or no response. Uh, almost all the patients living with 20 years of follow-up. So it's the one scenario in the clinic where we actually talk about maybe truly curing the cancer. Patients can go on and on with the complete effect, uh, but unfortunately only a small fraction of the patients that receive that style of therapy. Uh, partial response in a, in a time where there really weren't other therapies to offer patients um, seemed to have an effect. Patients did live longer. They shrunk the disease, reset the clock. Uh, they did better than patients that had no effect by IL-2. Uh, so I put together a table um, that I hope convinces you that we we're making some progress uh, in the field of kidney cancer when you look over a very broad interval of time. Um, and so focusing really on the overall survival data with different groups of patients and the, it doesn't project very well, but the coloring of the different lines uh, corresponds to the timeline I showed you and the different eras of therapy for kidney cancer. So the first line uh, harkens back to studies done with interferon, where the comparison were the drugs available in the early 80s or even older drugs, conventional chemotherapy agents, hormonal therapy that was sometimes applied. That was really uh, extremely ineffective. Uh, response rates of tumor shrinkage less than 10%. And a median overall survival of cohorts of patients formally recorded in, in research studies of six to nine months. So the midpoint of the survival, extremely bad uh, for the historical experience of kidney cancer. Uh, the cytokine drugs uh, moved the bar. They were good enough to gain FDA approval and become standard treatments, although uh, were highly imperfect. Uh, rates of response of, of 12 to 20 percent uh, for interferon and interleukin-2. Uh, and in large studies done, phase three studies, median survival in the teens were, were beyond a year. Um, recognizing that the, the best response uh, was limited to, to a very small fraction of patients. So when you look at the midpoint of all patients treated, you're, you're missing the patients deriving the most benefit, but these drugs did seem to be better than what had been available previously. Jump forward to the targeted agents we now commonly use. Uh, in the research studies that gained their FDA approval, uh, comparing these drugs <clears throat> to interferon alpha, these drugs came out ahead. Uh, so either Sutent or Votrin, uh, response rates now of 30% of patients and median survival of, of months counted out in the 20s, 22 months, 26 months. The bevacizumab interferon combination, similar numbers for response and overall survival, not terribly different. So we think we've moved the bar once again with our targeted therapies, uh, but the current state of the art isn't stopping after the first therapy is applied for most patients. Uh, we believe the natural history of these drugs is eventual um, tumor resistance, the tumor grows back and we move on to an alternate therapy. So how can we gain a picture of using multiple sequential agents? That's a really hard uh, uh, perspective and number to come up with to give you something that tells you what's truly happening. Uh, but one study uh, that used two drugs in sequence as part of a study called the RECORD-3 trial, patients received sunitinib or everolimus uh, in sequence. And the alternating sequences were both studied head to head, 50-50 randomization. The sunitinib first, Everlimus second, proved to be best. Um, but the point of this is to show you that data was collected over two drugs given in sequence. And so the response rate of first line uh, sunitinib, not so different than the phase three study, makes the point that there's some heterogeneity in an absolute number uh, if you look at multiple studies. So you can't be too honed in on, on uh, the absolute number. But again, looking at overall survival of patients that received two drugs in sequence, so the duration that they're able to use the drugs, uh, prog progression-free survival, that's my mouse, uh, 25 months versus 10 to 12 months for, the, for a single agent, and then 32 months median survival, so the midpoint of the population getting two drugs in a row. And we think that that uh, effect is manifesting itself as patients move on to third and fourth drugs uh, as, as currently practiced for many patients that the average survival is getting better and better. It's kind of hard to capture by individual research studies, but we do think we're making progress that we're moving the bar. Uh, this number, 32 months, certainly looks a whole lot better than a six to nine month, nine month median survival from the late 80s. Is it 32 months time of diagnosis or time in treatment time? Time from start of therapy. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, a figure that's called the waterfall plot. Uh, the way data is commonly reflected uh, in research studies because I think uh, that response rate number is a little bit misleading. You think 30 percent, yeah, that's, that's not such a big number. Uh, this drug's not so great. 
Um, but I think this gives you a better reflection of what we actually experience in the clinic and what we think about these drugs. So this is the figure from a study with um, pizopinib or Votrin, a drug many of you here probably have actually taken. Uh, and there's guidelines about how you interpret radiology studies as you participate in a study, you collect uh, imaging data, and you, you put a label on what's happening to patients. They're having progression, they're having stable tumor findings, they're having a response, and what that means, a partial or complete response. So uh, before you start on a treatment, you obtain a scan, it shows you a spectrum of tumor findings, and as you move forward in time, you receive a drug, you repeat the same scan, and you compare uh, the scan findings. So the tumor that you had before you started, you look at it again and you actually measure uh, the size of lesions, the lesions got bigger or got smaller, you normalize those values to where you started. And so if your tumor grew bigger, uh, you have uh, tumor findings that fall above the zero line, uh, your tumor grew. If your tumor got smaller, you fall below the zero line. So this represents shrinkage of tumor compared to where you started before therapy was applied. So the point of this, this plot, this is the best response seen at any point in time after starting pizopinib therapy on a clinical trial is that 70 to 80 percent of patients have their starting tumors shrink down incrementally after they start therapy. Uh, even though, so in this study, the response rate you'd read in the study abstracts is 35 percent response rate. That's true. Uh, and how do they come up with that number? Well, the, the guidelines for applying um, a, a response category say that to label somebody as a responder, you have to have at least 30% shrinkage, the dotted line, of your tumor compared to baseline. So a lot of patients, their tumor gets a little bit smaller, but it doesn't meet the 30% criteria, uh, and that's labeled as, as not a response, their stable disease. If your tumor shrinks down, that's based on the tumors that you had before you started therapy. If you collect a brand new tumor, the guidelines are intolerant to any new tumor findings, and you're labeled as disease progression even if your starting tumors got smaller. So the blue lines here are patients that their baseline tumors got a lot smaller, but they had a new tumor finding and they are labeled as progressing disease. So you look at that and you realize we're looking at a subset of patients that had pretty significant tumor shrinkage and labeling them as disease response, the 35%. But what we're thinking about when we see you in the clinic, we're saying, well, are drugs imperfect? It's not gonna put you into a cure where we're gonna stop the therapy. We really are just trying to control the disease, stop it from growing, stop the cancer from spreading, making you sick and causing problems. So everybody that's having a nice effect where the disease really isn't growing or changing in a meaningful way, we're gonna roll forward, say the drug's working just fine, that's what we wanted, that's what we expected. And so the percent of patients that we think we're benefiting uh, is the solid majority, 70, 80% of patients with our targeted therapies. And so I think this graphical picture hopefully gives you a better flavor of what happens to individual tumors when you apply these drugs when you look at research studies and you start seeing 20, 30, 35% response rate, that feels like a smaller number than the group of patients that we think are benefiting uh, and how we, we think about these drugs. So, uh, unfortunately, even our best drugs, uh, the natural history for most patients is the tumors become resistant, they start to grow back. And then what do you do next? So right now, state of the art, most patients are gonna get offered either Sutent or Votrin, um, there's nuances to the two drugs. Uh, we can talk about that at the end. Our IL-2 patients, if it doesn't work, and unfortunately that's the solid majority of IL-2 patients, we're gonna offer them the best available targeted therapy. They're also gonna move on to Sutent and Votrin, so just about everybody in the clinic is gonna wind up here. At some point in time, we're gonna say, oh, it's not doing the job any longer. Uh, we need to move on and try a second therapy. So what is state of the art for the second therapy you're gonna to apply to kidney cancer? And that's where things have really changed dramatically in the last eight months. Uh, so until November of 2015, there were two drugs that had done uh, large-scale advanced testing in this context, failure of primary therapy. And so we were almost always choosing between Everolimus uh, and Excitinib as our two best drugs. There was no head-to-head -head data, so one or the other, um, there really wasn't a compelling reason to say one was the best. But we now, have three brand new options to treat patients in this, uh, in this setting. So the drug nivolumab or Octivo, uh, an immunotherapy compound, the first entrant for kidney cancer from what are called immune checkpoint blocking drugs, uh, cabozantinib, an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so related to Sutent and Votriant, uh, and a third option, linvatinib, another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, another oral agent that was studied in combination with Everolimus, so a two-drug cocktail, 
and each of these studies compared itself to Everolimus, a perfectly acceptable standard agent that was used as secondary therapy. And each of these three large studies said the new drug was better than Everolimus. So what that means for Everolimus is bad news. Uh, nobody's going to look at Everolimus as being a smart choice as single agent second therapy for kidney cancer. So now we've got three brand new choices, plus we still have exitinib uh, as being a little bit older drug that's also available to us. Uh, once again, just to point out, uh, again, our therapies are imperfect. Clinical trials are a very sensible choice. That's always in the background when we're talking about what are we going to do next. So kind of a busy table, but I wanted to put out there um, this truly the discussion that was had at the big uh, clinical oncology meeting, ASCO 2016. Uh, there wasn't brand new data for kidney cancer. It was rehashing this flurry of activity and three brand new drugs for kidney cancer. And what does it mean? What are we actually going to do with our patients? Which drugs are we going to select? So let's just walk through this and look at a couple of issues. Uh, we're looking at um, four different drugs that are all sensible options, axitinib and the three new players for um, previously treated. So the data reflects patients that had a prior tyrosine kinase inhibitor, almost always Sutent or Votrin that's failing, and they're moving on to a second therapy. The three new guys all compared to Everolimus. Uh, the axitinib data was collected in comparison to serafinib. And let's look at, uh, my highlighting's not really working. Uh, the first three lines here are metrics of the anti-tumor properties. So overall response rate, and we just spent a minute educating ourselves about, you know, what does that really mean? Uh, but we have to have everyone measure in the same fashion so we can compare between trials. And so we know a little bit now about what we're seeing when we're seeing this response, the extent of shrinkage uh, in patients. So overall response rate across the board, the new guys, uh, high teens, 20s, 35% with the combination. Uh, those numbers sound pretty good compared to 9% for uh, the axitinib drug. But more importantly, I think, when you look at survival, at the end of the day, imperfect drugs, we're really just wanting to stop cancer growth, control it, have you function well, uh, perform at a very good level. So perhaps less important than whether the tumor shrinks or doesn't shrink, uh, are we stopping the cancer growth and you're living the life you want to live? So the survival, I would say, is probably the most important statistic. And so the axitinib uh, median survival in TKI failures of 15 months was state-of-the-art until last November. And all three of the new guys look to be meaningfully better, so 20 to 25 months of median survival with any of the new agents. So uh, I would have to say, I think right now our practice would be to pick one of the new choices uh, and skip over uh, the older choices that we had. The flip side is, well, we apply a new drug, what are you taking on in terms of, of nuisance and toxicity? Are we going to make it profoundly ill and um, it's not going to go well? So the bottom lines here all look at metrics of um, side effects and problems with the drug. So what fraction of patients had to have the dose of the drug cut back? Uh, for the two new oral agent options, pretty substantial. More than half of patients didn't tolerate the maximum dose and cut the dose back. Uh, nivolumab, as it was developed, there was no option for changing dose. It's a fixed dose, and so that's not meaningful for nivolumab. Uh, and then uh, side effect profile. So, uh, there's codification research studies for side effects. They all get a list uh, listed out, rostered out, so what fraction of patients have side effects, and then there's grading for how extreme they are, one, two, three, four. One and twos are things that are mild, that really don't inter interfere with your, your daily function. Grade three and grade four make you sick, cause problems, you need a remedy, you have to stop therapy that you're taking. So we're most interested in the grade three and grade four um, side effect profile. So the nivolumab, uh, numbers for um, stopping the medication outright or having bad problems, I would say look better than their comparison here, uh, these guys that can really give pa patients bad side effects. Now, the oral agents uh, are fairly flexible. You can stop them for a period of time and let the side effects fade out. You might try again at a lower dose. So there's a lot of work that goes into trying to optimize things. But uh, I would say the field is really quite pleased with nivolumab as being a drug that generally goes pretty smoothly for patients and very often uh, traffics with very few side effects. So uh, we definitely, I think, at our institution and as a field, uh, are really taken with immunotherapy. Um, for, for kidney cancer, for melanoma doctors, it's preaching to the choir. We've been using immunotherapy for 20 plus years uh, and so are kind of outliers in the broader field of oncology. 
But a uh, point about the immunotherapy drugs, I think this, this figure really illustrates very well. Um, this is neither kidney cancer or nivolumab. Uh, what this is is a figure of melanoma patients treated with a drug called Urvoy or ipilimumab. That was the first drug in this class of what are called immune checkpoint blocking antibodies. Uh, it's been in clinical development the longest, and so we have the longest uh, perspective on what this drug can accomplish. So this is looking at survival of melanoma patients with a timeline that extends to 10 years from the start of therapy. And so what this shows you is that, unfortunately for many patients, the drug does virtually nothing. They, their disease grows, progresses, they die of their disease. But by about three years, you hit a plateau where this flattens out. So patients with long-term survival of their disease receiving an immunotherapy compound. And I can tell you that the incidence of a complete response with this drug is really quite uncommon, less than 5%. Uh, and what's happening here, the fascinating biology, are patients that still retain tumor findings on their scans, but they stay dormant, they stay stable, and time goes on and on. So disease control uh, in a subset of patients that seems extremely long-lived, very durable, but imperfect. It's not a complete effect. Um, and so the idea that for some patients with immunotherapy, the so-called tail of the survival curve may flatten out and be very long. And so if you can't achieve a complete cure, maybe the next best thing is more or less permanent control of the disease, uh, and you go on and on without the disease changing. So now this is nivolumab, and this is kidney cancer, and this was data shown uh, this summer at ASCO, the longest survival follow-up observation in patients receiving nivolumab. This is the very first study of nivolumab in a, in a variety of patients, including kidney cancer, and then a dedicated kidney cancer study, a phase two study, looking at the same metric overall survival of patients that enrolled in these studies and got nivolumab. And the shape of the survival curve hearkening to the ipilimumab data, although with less follow-up, but lines drawn here at four and five years of follow-up, total patient numbers are not terribly large but giving you the feeling that there's a flattening of the survival curve. There isn't a steady degradation where eventually you're gonna cross the zero line and all patients uh, have, have died from their disease. So maybe once again, uh, we can achieve very long-lived disease control that goes on and on for many years, even if it's imperfect and patients still retain uh, findings of their disease on their scans. So let me show you a figure. Is that, did that, that last graph, does that represent people in, in stage one, two, three, and four total, or is it? For their, for their cancer? Yeah, what, what they presented with? So these are all patients that have metastatic kidney cancer. Okay. To get on to both phase one and phase two clinical trials, you already had prior therapy, at least one prior treatment that failed to be eligible to receive what was an investigational compound at the time these studies began. So these are all metastatic kidney cancer patients, and once again, all clear cell metastatic kidney cancer patients that all received nivolumab as part of these studies. Uh, the data is a little bit unclean in that uh, some patients in this survival data set left the studies and maybe went on to receive other types of therapy. And so it's not patients that are ongoing necessarily actively receiving nivolumab, but it is the true survival of what happened to these patients that participated in the trials uh, and did get drug as part of the studies. Uh, this is not a survival figure, but this is a metric of tumor findings in two patients treated here uh, at our campus as part of the large phase three study of nivolumab. Um, that was the data that was uh, criteria for FDA approval. Um, so showing you here in, in real patients uh, what the biology that we're, we're speaking about. Um, so each spot on this graph is a reflection of the CT scan findings of these patients uh, time zero is the start of participation in a clinical trial, both these patients getting the nivolumab drug. Uh, and so again, comparing their scan findings for overall tumor size to their pretreatment baseline imaging. So both patients, every time they get scanned, the first couple of scans, their tumors get smaller and get smaller, but finally sort of hit a, a plateau here. This isn't 100% shrinkage of their tumor. They still have abnormalities in their scans that we're calling tumor. They've become very stable, they haven't changed. Both patients are well over two years of ongoing nivolumab therapy. And so is this now the biology, the pattern of, of existence that we see with the ipilimumab drug and melanoma that extends out to 10 years? How long is this gonna go on? Is it gonna go on two years, five years, eight years, 10 years? Is this uh, you know, functionally 
a, a complete effect uh, and, and ongoing durable control of tumor. We don't know, we need longer follow-up, but it's uh, provocative findings that make us think that maybe there's something that's unique about our immunotherapy compounds that may not be common to the targeted agents. And so it sways us to think about prioritizing the immunotherapy drugs ahead of, of targeted agents. Uh, and so last point, um, given what we consider to be a very good patient tolerance with the new immunotherapy drugs, uh, they're, they're getting uh, great attention in the field. Uh, and this is just a little schematic showing you that they're going to become the building block to test combinations of checkpoint blocking drugs with a whole slew of other agents hoping to get a more potent uh, and more durable anti-cancer effect. Uh, nivolumab is an antibody that blocks a protein called PD-1. Uh, there are competing antibodies owned by other companies that share that identical biology. There are also similar antibodies that block uh, a very similar protein. The binding partner for PD-1 is called PD-L1, so a lock and key phenomenon. You can block either side of that interaction, and you, we think you get the same biological effect. Uh, so there are many of these agents uh, in development by different drug companies coming forward and looking to combine with other agents to trump nivolumab and do better with a combination approach. And these all reflect uh, research study opportunities that are actively in our clinic now or that we believe are coming to our clinic in the next several months. So combining these drugs with interleukin-2, combining these drugs with other similar agents, antibody molecules that have been generated to be very selective to manipulate other targets within the immune system. So each one of these names and numbers here is, is uh, a protein that's on T lymphocytes the same target for nivolumab and for the Uruvoy drug. So can you find other ways to manipulate the same immune compartment and get a more potent effect? So combinations of all these guys with PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies. A brand new drug class, what's called uh, uh, what's a, a metabolic therapy, a drug that blocks glutaminase, which degrades glutamine uh, uh, by the tumor. The tumor's doing this. That's thought to be a bad thing for your T lymphocytes. They need uh, glutamine as an energy source. So manipulating the so-called microenvironment around the tumor to augment immune responses that may be occurring in that space. Uh, combining one drug that works with the second drug that works, old school oncology therapy. Uh, a is good and B is good. A plus B might be better. So mixing our checkpoint blocking drugs that work in their own right with our targeted therapy drugs that work in their own right and see if those combinations are a smarter way to go. Um, Combining these drugs with something called epigenetic modulation, uh, for today's purposes, uh, we won't worry too much about what that means, but a way to manipulate tumors that are thought to change gene expression profiles, perhaps make the tumor look more inflamed, uh, be more exciting to the immune system, and give you a better effect. So looking uh, what's coming down the road uh, soon, what's maybe changing the way we practice kidney cancer therapy in the next couple of years, um, so looking to take the immune checkpoint drugs that are approved now for patients that have failed a prior therapy and saying, well, they look very promising, shouldn't we pull them up and use them as the initial therapy for our patients? So trying to prove that that's the right way to go in a formal research study uh, that gives you data that, that makes the case. So three different studies uh, with compounds owned by different uh, companies that are similar in concept, uh, combining nivolumab, uh, the drug that's truly FDA approved for kidney cancer with the Uruvoy drug or ipilimumab in a two-drug combination. That's a study that's comparing those two drugs to Sutent head-to-head for untreated patients. That study's already completed its patient enrollment, so now we're just going to wait and see uh, when the data is presented and what the results are, probably a couple years away uh, from uh, a result on that. A drug that's a PD-L1 targeting antibody. Uh, and combining that with bevacizumab that we know is, is, is a standard drug for kidney cancer. So a targeted therapy plus an immunotherapy. Again, comparing to Sutan. And then a, a similar approach, another PDL1 antibody owned by a different company, combining with a TKI exitinib as a combination approach, again, compared to Sutan. So uh, as Everlimus was beat up uh, with all the new drugs coming available, um, Sutan will be the common comparator. So we'll have three uh, competing studies that are similar in kind uh, and see if one or more of these approaches uh, gains uh, the upper hand and becomes the standard approach to treating patients a couple years down the road. So uh, a couple points I hope, I hope came through. 
Uh, when you look very broadly over time, I would say that the pace of drug development and new drug approval for kidney cancer uh, is accelerating. Uh, if you look in, in recent years uh, versus the distant past, uh, we think our new drugs are better than what we've had before. We're making incremental progress in disease control. Uh, the most recent flurry of new approvals are all for patients that had failed prior therapy. Uh, we're very interested in the new immunotherapy checkpoint blocking drugs in their own right, uh, and they are going to be the building block for uh, multiple research studies of a variety of combinations uh, looking to improve on their activity. Uh, there's uh, studies that are looking to change the way we come after patients and apply therapy in the first-line setting. Um, and so that's all very promising and optimistic, but it remains a, a true statement that true cures of cancer and the ability to stop therapy because the cancer's gone remains a very elusive goal, not only for kidney cancer, but uh, advanced cancers across the board. So um, that's a very high bar. We'd love to see patients start developing complete responses and come off therapy. But so far, that really isn't part of the equation for advanced kidney cancer. So I, I appreciate the chance to speak today. Uh, that was kind of a, a very cursory overview. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. If anybody has a couple of questions, um, a question. There's you, in one of the graphs that you had there. You had papillary type one and two. What's the difference? What's the difference between papillary one and two? And is one more aggressive than the other? So that's a distinction made histologically by the the pathologist in terms of the growth pattern of the tumor. Uh, there's no formal metabolic or molecular profiling that gives you an absolute distinction between those two. There are gene differences that are, are somewhat unique to the two different um, subtypes. Uh, generally for therapy, there's not a distinction made between those two subtypes, so papillary gets bundled together in terms of thinking about what we're going to do therapy-wise. And I have one more question. Uh, you were talking about combination therapies, the Optivo plus Ipilimab. Yeah, it'd be limited. What would be the, and that's in a research study at, at present, right? So or that was the research study that's completed its enrollment, so it's not an active opportunity for patients. Sure. Uh, but now we have to wait to see what the outcome shows. Okay, thank you. So maybe one more, and then we should move forward with the next speaker. You were talking particularly about clear cell, and I wondered if there was anything that you knew that um, worked against papillary. And then um, also the secondary thing was it talked about the studies where they compared it to Everol and Nymus, or however you say that, but you also had in, in Lida or whatever listed there. Um, did they compare against that at all? So for papillary kidney cancer, um, overall, when you look at the success of targeted therapies, uh, if you bundle all of the non-clear cell patients together, the, the outcome success is inferior. So having a non-clear cell diagnosis is a bad deal. Uh, the drugs that we have available seem to work less well. There are no drugs that were developed specifically for papillary or chromophobe patients in mind. So we take what we know about results with clear cell and we apply it to the other subsets, but don't really know for sure uh, what's best. There is a data set of head-to-head -head comparison of Sutent versus the Everlimus drug, Affinitor, and Sutent was superior. So based on that available data, I typically recommend the patient starting with Sutent for papillary kidney cancer, unless we have a research study opportunity. Um, and again, success is, is uh, incomplete. Uh, so if something that looks promising that's brand new, uh, we're happy to try and make that available as a choice for, for non-clear cell patients. Okay. 